Good afternoon and welcome, uh, Kwe Jalasi. This is the second of three expert panels uh, focused on the question of how do we move forward the, the political, moral, and legal commitments to advance Indigenous and non-Indigenous reconciliation. Uh, I'm Constance McIntosh, Acting Scholarly Director of the McEachan Institute for Public Policy and Governance and Professor at the Schulich School of Law. Um, Dalhousie University, where I'm streaming to you from, is located in Shibuktuk, Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and here our relationships are governed by the treaties of peace and friendship. Um, to uh, begin our event properly, I would like to now introduce Nakawe Elder Jerry Masqua Leblanc. Um, she's going to be providing us with an opening prayer. Elder Jerry is a Bear Clan knowledge keeper and a residential school survivor from Kisikus First Nation in Saskatchewan. And we are honored and delighted that she's agreed to work with us here as the coordinator of the elders programs so or the elders in residence program at Dalhousie University. Um, Elder Jerry. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jerry Musquelablon. I'm Anishinaabe Kwe from Kisikwins First Nations in Saskatchewan. Mi'kmaq has been my home for decades. I thank the Mi'kmaq for letting me practice my traditions on their territory. I have been given the honor of offering a blessing to this panel discussion. Creator, Kichiminitu Gizalk. Nindishni Kosmis Gwiginukwe, Nindo Demakwa, Nindu Juba Kisigunz, Migmagi Yadash Nindanungum. We honor you with this prayer. We are the, the descendants of the many peoples you so long ago chose to live in harmony on Turtle Island. We give thanks for allowing us all to gather here today. Good Creator, more than ever, we need your strength, guidance, and truth. Give us the ability to recognize and use the gifts and teachings you have provided. Help us pass the virtues of respect and sharing to others. We direct our attention to the life forces on Mother Earth. She has given birth to all animal creatures and to all plants that nourish us. For this, we give thanks. We ask that you help those who are experiencing difficulty and conflict in their lives find peace and comfort. We pray for our Mother Earth so that she may recover from the many sores we have inflicted upon her. We pray for the good of our nations, communities, our families, elders, leaders, and our medicine people. Creator, we humbly ask for your help so that the treaties between nations be respected, protected, and honored as they were intended for as long as the sun shines, the rivers flow, and the grass grows. We promise to work together so that all steps we take will become the path of peace for our future generations. Aho, all my relations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Elder Jerry. That was beautiful. Um, so today's panel discussion focuses on implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, colloquially known as UNDRIP. Um, in 2007, UNDRIP was adopted by most countries of the world, and in 2016, Canada formally endorsed this declaration without reservation. And in 2021, June of this year, uh, Canada enacted federal legislation that it would take all measures necessary to ensure that Canadian law is consistent with UNDRIP. And so the question is, you know, now what? What are the real challenges? You know, what are the flashpoint issues? Are there really game stoppers? And, how do we get to meaningful implementation? What does it actually look like? So we have three amazing speakers here today. I'm going to introduce each in turn as they give us their opening comments and then move to posing discussion questions to the panelists. And if audience members have any questions they'd like to see posed, um, can you please type them into the uh, Q&A box um, on the Zoom screen? and include your name, if you're the media, with which outlet, and who you'd like the question to be posed to, and we'll try to get to those questions if, uh, if we have time. I'm going to introduce our first speaker, and that is uh, Brenda Gunn. 
So Brenda's guns experience and expertise is, is wide ranging. Um, it runs from making submissions to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights on Genocide in Guatemala, to working locally with Manitoba First Nations on treaty right realizations, to having developed the handbook, which is widely used across Canada to understand UNDRIP. Um, she is a rightfully proud Métis woman and mother and auntie, um, and she's currently seconded from her position at the University of Manitoba to work as one of the directors for the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation. Um, can you please share your opening comments with us, Professor Gunn? Thank you, Constance, for that kind introduction. And thank you, Elder, so much for your words and for starting us off in a good way, especially as we work from home, it can be hard to feel centered and connected. So I really appreciate the support that you're providing to this panel. As I reflect on this panel and where we are in Canada right now, it, it's hard to know exactly what to say. I think we have a lot of optimism. We're seeing some traction and some movement. But I think we also want to make sure that we're maintaining vigilance and, and really keeping the international standards to the degrees that they are expected to be implemented. So when I think about maybe what I could contribute as opening comments, I was thinking about my new position as academic and research director for the National Center for Truth and Reconciliation and the UN Declaration. And so as was mentioned, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada did refer to the UN Declaration as the framework for reconciliation. And so I thought maybe I would just spend a minute or two talking about why, from my perspective, I think the UN Declaration provides us that framework. So when trying to answer this question, I think we can turn to the preamble. And when you look at the preamble of the UN Declaration, it really sets out the context of why we have the UN Declaration and really helps guide our understanding and implementation of the substantive provisions. So looking at the very first paragraph, the preambular paragraph of the UN Declaration, it starts by saying that Indigenous peoples are peoples. Now, hopefully this isn't a groundbreaking statement to say to most people in the audience today. I think we're at a point where we're starting to accept Indigenous people, our people, though there are still many challenges in law where there's um, racist undertones that continue to influence Canadian law. But what we can see is a recognition that Indigenous peoples are peoples and that we are to be treated equally with all peoples. That doesn't mean formal equality where you treat everyone the same, recognizing that Indigenous peoples are also Indigenous and that we should be celebrated and have room to perpetuate our own cultures and knowledge systems. So with that idea of Indigenous peoples as peoples that are part of the humanity of the world, we then go and see a recognition in, by the United Nations in the Declaration that Indigenous peoples have suffered from historic injustices. And here we have a clear recognition that colonialism has occurred and is occurring in many nation states and is negative. It has a negative impact on Indigenous people's ability to perpetuate themselves as distinct people. However, the UN Declaration notes that if we want to reconcile, and they talk about uh, you know, resetting the relationship, that we must really switch from that colonial relationship to a relationship now where we recognize rights. And I think this is really important in Canada is somehow I continue to hear corners of Canadian society that are expressing concern about this, you know, recognizing special rights for special people. And I don't know how we keep getting stuck in that sentiment. But what the UN is saying is that by recognizing the rights of Indigenous peoples, we're actually going to enhance harmonious and cooperative relations. So in countries like Canada, where colonialism exists and continues to suppress Indigenous people's rights to self-determination, 
we have to work to recognize the rights of Indigenous peoples if we want to work towards reconciliation. So that requires us to recognize the ways in which we're broken in Canadian society and take real steps to fix that. And fixing things includes recognizing the fundamental basic human rights that are set out in the UN Declaration. And doing so, recognizing and protecting those rights is actually going to reset the relationship, moving away from a colonial relationship where Canadian governments make all decisions for Indigenous peoples to a relationship that is now based on principles of justice, human rights, equality, non-discrimination, good faith, values that Canadians say they espouse all the time. So with that understanding that colonialism has had a negative impact on Indigenous peoples and that if we want to reconcile, we have to work forward on protecting the rights of Indigenous peoples, the, UN the United Nations solemnly proclaims the UN Declaration as a standard to be pursued jointly, right? So this is then really critical, is that Canadian governments can't work unilaterally to implement the UN Declaration. They must work with Indigenous peoples to understand the scope of the rights, understand how Indigenous peoples understand their rights and work to implement that in Canadian law. And so that's the sort of um, setting the stage of why I think in how the UN Declaration provides a framework for reconciliation. When uh, I think I have a couple of minutes left, maybe really quickly, I think then you can start to go into the substantive provisions and think about how do, does recognizing the rights promote reconciliation, particularly in response to colonial policies like residential schools. We can see articles one and two, equality, non-discrimination, article three related to self-determination. And self-determination just has two basic aspects. One is that right to internally control our own affairs. So the rights of Indigenous peoples to continue and maintain our own social, economic, uh, legal institutions, as well as the um, right to set that relationship between Indigenous peoples and the nation states. And in many areas of the country, that will include going back to treaties that were signed and restoring and building the relationship based on those treaty relationships. And so then when you look through the remaining provisions of the UN Declaration, we can see that they touch on every legacy issue that is set out in the calls to action, right? So we can see references on Indigenous peoples' rights uh, to maintain their own legal institutions and addressing justice and child welfare and culture and language and health and education. And so it really does set the basic um, minimum standards for, Can for Canada and for Indigenous peoples to work on renewing that relationship. And I think I'll leave it there for now. Thank you. Thank you, um, Professor Gunn. That was a fantastic overview and setting up the context and then giving us some really important um, sort of germinal pieces to hold on to. Um, I'd like to introduce our second panelist now, and that's uh, Independent Senator uh, Brent Cotter. And um, Professor Senator Cotter uh, brings us amazing life and professional experiences, especially in public service for Saskatchewan and, and nationally. Uh, so we served Saskatchewan's Deputy Minister of Justice and Deputy Attorney General and Deputy Minister of Intergovernmental and Aboriginal Affairs. Uh, trained as a lawyer, he currently serves the Federation of Law Society's National Committee on Implementing the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's Calls to Action. And I note that in his current role as an independent senator, he's also serving on their standing committee on legal and constitutional affairs. Um, over to you, um, Senator Cotter. Thank you, uh, Professor McIntosh, and thank you, Elder Musquebo LeBlanc, for your introductory prayer. Uh, I think it sets the stage for this uh, important and, and meaningful discussion for Indigenous peoples in Canada, but all Canadians as a whole. 
I thought that I would uh, make some opening remarks um, with respect to uh, three or four what I think are the big requirements uh, going forward with respect to the implementation of the UNDRIP legislation so that it has the kind of meaning that Professor Gunn spoke about um, for all of us. For myself, I think this is one of three or four large society changing initiatives that has been undertaken by the government of Canada in its acknowledgement and embrace of of UNDRIP and Bill C-15. Others include the commitment to net zero and addressing of the climate change challenge for Canada, recovering from the pandemic and what uh, post-pandemic prosperity may be for all Canadians. And there will be others. But in any event, I see this as a major pillar of our path forward. Um, I supported Bill C-15, uh, spoke uh, to it, uh, and uh, voted in favor of it when the matter was considered in the Senate. Um, I think it's fair to say that most to nearly all senators were sympathetic with and supportive of many of the concepts. Some groups, for reasons not clear to me, um, voted against, but I don't think that that was necessarily an opposition to the concept of the path forward that um, uh, Professor Gunn spoke to and others have in the past. Um, so I'm hopeful that there is still um, a knitting together of um, well-meaning Canadians of Indigenous and non-Indigenous backgrounds with respect to uh, addressing the challenges and opportunities that UNDRIP presents for us. I'd like to speak, I think, to um, what I think are the uh, four of the big requirements going forward that will be critical uh, to the success of the implementation and embrace of UNDRIP so that um, the country and Indigenous people and Indigenous governments and non-Canadians and existing governments can all be beneficiaries. And I personally think that this is one of the most critical opportunities we have had to redress the, the failings of, of the past with respect to Canada and Indigenous people and to create a more uh, fair and equal society and a prosperous one, uh, particularly for those who have not um, participated in the prosperity of the country as much as they deserved to. Uh, those four points, I think, are firstly the requirement, a critical requirement that all the kind of existing orders of government, but particularly the federal, provincial and territorial uh, governments be on side in the direction that would be required for the responsiveness to the mandate of UNDRIP. Um, secondly, I think it rests with the federal government to do a meaningful screen of federal legislation so that it fulfills its commitment attached to the language of UNDRIP to ensure that uh, its federal legislation is respectful of and meets the equality and other uh, requirements and entitlements of Indigenous people. We did this, for example, in the mid-1980s when uh, the uh, equality provision of the Charter of Rights was adopted by Canada and all governments across the country did a screen of all of their legislation to, to try their, their very best to ensure that it uh, met the equality requirements of the Charter. And I think a similar exercise, probably guided by the work that uh, Professor Gunn has done, uh, would be meaningfully beneficial. Not an overnight task, but an important one that would show a commitment to the kind, not just the, the, the legal language, but also the spirit of UNDRIP and Bill C-15. Third, and on a slightly more uh, uh, sort of practical level, I think it rests with Indigenous communities to identify who are the spokespeople for their communities in work that will go forward, whether it is in resource development, whether it is in the uh, empowerment or transfer or acknowledgement of authority to deliver the kinds of local governmental services that have historically been delivered to Indigenous communities by non-Indigenous governments. And fourthly, I think it uh, behooves the federal government to articulate and develop what its approach will be to some of the key concepts of UNDRIP and most notably free prior and informed consent. It doesn't mean that necessarily the federal government approach will be the authoritative one, but it needs to provide to indigenous communities, indigenous people and non-indigenous players, for example, in the area of resource development, what Ottawa thinks the new framework for uh, participation and partnership needs to be going forward. I won't say an awful lot about that, but I think I would uh, argue that the, the, um, the terrain is discoverable uh, and it has been examined by many 
uh, academics and other uh, thoughtful people uh, to identify that we are no longer talking just about an enriched duty to consult. We're not talking about vetoes, but we are talking about a contextual arrangement going forward that needs to be respectful of involvement in decision-making authority by Indigenous people in ways that we haven't in the past, richer than we have had in the past. Let me say a little bit about uh, one or two of these. I wanted to identify the frame of reference and these four big requirements. There probably are others, but I think these are important ones from my point of view. And just say something in particular in relation to federal, provincial, and territorial governments. Many of the ways in which we will achieve reconciliation and make it possible for Indigenous people and governments to achieve genuine self-determination implicate provincial jurisdiction, a jurisdictional issue. As others have wisely noted, there's an intersection of authority and responsibility as between federal and provincial governments when it comes to Indigenous people and their interests. This is true with respect to health, education, social services. The importance of this intersection, if I may say, getting this intersection right so that we are all moving together forward together is critical. Um, let me cite as one example, uh, British Columbia. British Columbia, as you will know, has adopted legislation unanimously in the BC legislature to embrace the principles of UNDRA. In the dialogue between the provincial government and Indigenous leaders and Indigenous governmental leaders in British Columbia, uh, work has been done to prioritize what should be worked on first. And the first priority agreed upon is child welfare. Not surprising and uh, uh, admirable. This is, in conventional thinking, largely a matter of provincial jurisdiction, perhaps not specifically with respect to on reserve child welfare, but the province has an awfully big aspect of this question uh, in its jurisdictional lap. So the absence of a provincial government in participation in uh, going forward solutions that will empower Indigenous communities and governments to deliver and have the resources to deliver the kind of programs and services that they are wanting to deliver to their citizens and in ways that are far more culturally appropriate than has been the case in the past has to be done with an engagement of provincial governments, it seems to me. So one of the challenges that exists here, and it's critical, quite frankly, that Ottawa play a role in this is uh, coaxing might be too gentle a word, but an expectation that provinces uh, and territories take this question seriously in terms of their involvement in under if you take for example resource development the same kinds of questions will arise in terms of the, the reach of provinces into these questions particularly with respect to traditional territories and it'll be critical that provinces uh, uh, come to the table with the same kind of goodwill that i think ottawa is now showing and creates opportunities that will benefit indigenous people indigenous governments and make possible many appropriately developed opportunities for economic prosperity for all going forward. I won't go any further than that, but I'd be happy to chat about this point and some of the other ones that I've identified that it seems to me are important for us to work out collectively, constructively, and create this, uh, what I think is potentially an unbelievable opportunity for the health of our country and to benefit Indigenous people who have been kind of left out of that prosperity, both in economic and social and cultural terms, for far too long. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, um, Senator Cotter. Those were very dense and rich comments. I'm scratching them down. I probably didn't get all of them. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm going to introduce our third and final pam uh, panelist now, Dr. Pam Palmiter. Uh, Dr. Palmiter is uh, Mi'kmaq from Utiganchik First Nation. Um, she currently holds a chair in Indigenous Governance. Um, and Dr. Palmiter has been working on advancing the human rights of Indigenous peoples and their communities for decades. Um, I'd say since before her sons were born, who are now uh, into their early adulthood. Um, her work is grounded in community first, um, and it's absolutely fueled by passion. And she's on a whole bunch of those, you know, most influential lists. 
um, even got on the financial posts, most influential movers and shakers. Um, Pamela is very familiar to, to parliamentary and United Nations bodies where she's frequently called upon um, for her expertise. So I'm going to pass things over to you, Dr. Palmer. Thanks so much, Constance and everybody. Thanks for inviting me to be part of this event and to the Elder for opening it in a good way. Um, I'm super pumped to be here. I but it could be just my chronic state of being super pumped. I'm not quite sure. It's a good thing I have uh, handles on this chair. I'm I am honored to be a part of this amazing panel. I echo um, the things that have already been said uh, because they're they're really really important. And I wish we could all be together right now in Mi'kma'ki, but maybe next time we'll do this in person and have tons of people. But for today, I'm coming to you from sovereign Mississaugas of Scugog territory. And I think for me, I'd really like to focus my comments on the significance of UNDRIP in the context that this is, comes from Indigenous peoples. So this isn't just something that Canada dreamed up one day and thought, hey, maybe we should have something like this. I think if we were waiting for Canada to dream it up, we'd still be waiting. But this is like massive, massive, massive accomplishment by Indigenous peoples all over the world and i and i think we can't understate that because it's decades of work and not just on the undrip itself but also on all of the governance part of it the you know negotiating the strategizing the communicating the international diplomacy work that's required by our indigenous governance uh governments and our representatives to actually get this in motion because as any lawyer knows, law is kind of equal parts, the words on the paper, but there's also the politics that are involved, you know, and so there's a lot of politics in all of this. And First Nations and Indigenous governments here in Canada, Métis and Inuit and Native American governments in the U.S. had a significant role to play. I mean, think about the Honorable Graydon Nicholas. Um, you know, he's the first Native lawyer, first Native judge, first Governor General in New Brunswick. He was part of these discussions on UNDRIP in its very, very early days. How exciting is that? You know, um, or, or Sharon Venn, she's a Cree lawyer and an expert in, in international laws. She was a part of this. Romeo Saganash, you know, not only was he a part of this when he was the Grand Chief of the Council of the Crees, but he has been relentless in continuing to put legislation forward saying, come on, you got to implement this, you got to implement this. You know, people just, they, Indigenous peoples haven't been dissuaded from A, embracing human rights in general, but B, having something that's specific to Indigenous peoples that would act as, um, you know, a, a shield against ongoing injustice and also a recognition of who we are, of our sovereignty, our self-determination, independence, peoplehood, nationhood, whatever you want to call it, plus all of our laws. And since UNDRIP was adopted, you know, you've got Indigenous peoples and advocates on the ground, communities, our political organizations, however it is we're constructed as First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, who have been pleading, citing, referencing, mentioning uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples at international forums like the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights or the United Nations, like the many human rights treaty bodies, or before Parliament and Senate, and and the that's one of the reasons why they the you know the recommendation to implement UNDRIP was found in the recommendations for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the National Inquiry into Murder to Missing Indigenous Women and Girls and other commentary that's been made because that comes directly from Indigenous peoples saying we want this to be part of the ongoing relationship uh, because it it helps regulate that relationship in a way that it isn't regulated right now. I think some people hope Section 35 would be somewhat of a regulator and hold governments at bay, but we know it hasn't been. Everything is just still forging ahead, full steam ahead, whereas UNDRIP really speaks to something different. It's about recognizing the full scope of who we are as autonomous nations, our laws, our governing practices, our territories, our resources, Sources, um, all of our interests in that, as well as all of the cultural stuff, like uh, Dr. Brenda was talking about that. So if you think about it in that context, from like a governance like perspective, 
our official representatives, uh, both at the grassroots level and at the governance level from our sovereign nations, you know, the electorate, uh, elected traditional grassroots people we didn't just believe in the importance of human rights but we were fully engaged at the international level despite was what canada has been doing all of these decades uh advocating for ourselves making our own submissions and undrip is really that collective success that despite ongoing genocide despite ongoing racism racism, police shootings, you know, chronic poverty, theft of lands, murdered and missing, all of this, our advocates were still out there pursuing this from this governance concept. And so now we have a tool. Is it a perfect tool? I don't know. Uh, think about carpenters and plumbers. They have a million tools. They like some tools better than others. Some, some don't work as well in certain contexts, but it's a tool. And it's another one that we have in our basket to use moving forward. And the most, I think one of the most exciting parts of UNDRIP is that it recognizes that, you know, not only is this a minimum standard, but it's a tool we can use and, and measure government actions, but it doesn't limit Indigenous peoples in any way. It doesn't limit our laws. It doesn't limit, limit our governance practices. In fact, if you look at many of the Indigenous laws all over Turtle Island, many of our laws and standards uh, are superior to some of the things that are in UNDRIP. And that, that's the great thing about human rights. You don't have to do the minimum. You can actually go far and beyond and make it as great and wonderful as you want to. And I think that's a real opportunity here that maybe hasn't been focused on so much that yes, here's the, the floor, but infinity is what's possible here when we're talking about human beings and the planet and our relationships to one another. And I've also seen some really exciting movement in different Indigenous governance that I work with to officially adopt UNDRIP um, could be in reference to their laws or some of their policies or their codes or their bylaws or their just practices in general. Um, I've seen some of them uh, start the drafting process of using UNDRIP as the minimum standard for what will be the relationship the so-called nation-to-nation relationship with Canada or the provinces on what would be consultations, uh, so to speak. And, you know, there's there's always exceptions. Not everyone thinks about UNDRIP in these ways. Some haven't had time, some will need more time. But overall, for the First Nations that I work with here in Canada and the Native American tribal governments that I work with in the U.S., I've seen a real celebration of UNDRIP, uh, more so than I do in Canadian or American governments. And so I think, you know, that speaks to some of the work that we need to do. Clearly, like I said, UNDRIP's not perfect. No one thinks it's perfect, a document. And there might be some concerns that federal, provincial, municipal governments might not respect it, might not implement it, might continue to do what they've always done, like they do with Section 35 or any other law. And that's the likelihood of that happening is probably pretty good, but that doesn't detract from UNDRIP itself as a tool to keep pushing things forward. Uh, and the other thing about UNDRIP, and you know, this comes up a lot when I work with First Nations about what tools you want to work with within your own First Nation. And there's a you know, resistance to use federal tools or provincial tools because they're, you know, we have no control over developing them. They don't reflect us. They're often applied discriminatorily. But UNDRIP was drafted outside of Canada's Indian Act, outside of Canada's Section 35, outside of the whole mess that is colonization, oppression, discrimination, racism, and violence and oppression. That is Canada. Canada has had some influence, obviously, but it wasn't drafted within that context. It's completely outside of it. And it's one of the things that we have that is completely outside of that mess. And so that's another opportunity for going forward. I've seen First Nations and uh, tribal governments officially plead UNDRIP 
at the Inter-American Commission of the United Nations. I've seen them plead it in court or tribunal processes. Um, I've seen it, them cite UNDRIP uh, or the various articles in their resolutions, their political resolutions, political statements, like I said, in some of their bylaws, codes, and other laws. And I've also seen some work at the grassroots level in First Nations where they want to use UNDRIP in such a way as their minimum standard, not just for the relationship between them and Canadian governments, but also internally in their own government. That we, when we interpret our own laws, let's use UNDRIP as a minimum standard to make sure that none of our laws are perpetuating colonization that was imposed on us, but it acts as this you know, um, arbiter of, you know, what isn't, what isn't working because it is in violation of, you know, basic gender equality rights, for example, where is that coming from? And is that good for our first nation? And what does UNDRIP have to say about these things? So I find that's really exciting. Uh, and again, it takes that takes these conversations around governance and lawmaking and interpretation and, and legal systems outside of Canada's context and in more of a neutral-ish area. And I have to say ish because everything's you know politicized, but UNDRIP is a few steps removed from the mess. And I think that's helpful. I think that's helpful as a tool and it's something that you know we've been advocating. Um, I've also over the years, and I'm sure Brenda has heard First Nations say that if anyone is to be an arbiter of a dispute between Canada and say the Mi'kmaq nation, there seems to be some preference for there to be international standards, human rights standards or international arbiters more so than Canadian systems, which we know from every justice inquiry ever done in the history of this country is racially biased and discriminates against Indigenous peoples and leads to horrendous outcomes. I mean, I don't have to list here the Donald Marshall inquiry and the National Inquiry and the Truth and Reconciliation Inquiry and the Manitoba Aboriginal Justice Inquiry, Saskatchewan, Neil Stone Child Inquiry and everything, all of those. Massive problems not being addressed. In fact, everything's getting worse. This is an opportunity to look at this from a completely new lens, this human rights framework that we haven't been able to do from a governing perspective, despite the fact that we have the Charter of Rights, despite the fact that there's both federal and provincial human rights laws um, in this country and tribunals, hasn't been as effective as we had hoped. Maybe UNDRIP, maybe UNDRIP as this standard, as a screen, as a lens, as the arbiter, as the all of these things will help bring us about the radical change that's needed to undo the injustice. Because the injustice is radical. I mean, we're, we're talking about genocide here. So the solutions must also be radical. We, we can't have piecemeal equality. We can't have piecemeal justice or there is no justice. There's no such thing as incremental justice. You know, we've got to work on this stuff. So I say we need to look at this. Uh, remember that, you know, UNDRIP is not limited. Minimum standards, we can do what we want. UNDRIP supports our efforts. There's nothing in UNDRIP that limits what Indigenous peoples can or can't do in terms of reasserting their rights, reasserting their sovereignty, protecting their languages and cultures, protecting their territories. There's no limiting factor in that because human rights is the lens, you know? And so long as you're advancing human rights in a way that respects human rights, it's gonna be pretty hard to call that out as something wrong, even though Canada's current system criminalizes human rights defenders. And it's a major concern from the United Nations, the ongoing and increasing criminalization and violence and incarceration of indigenous land defenders, water protectors, human rights defenders. They just wrote a report on it. So I think you're going to see from an indigenous governance part side of things, more adoption of UNDRIP in general, the principles of it, the standards, measuring how we're you know, implementing our laws. But I think you're also gonna see on the other side of things, 
more indigenous governance governments wanting to be part of any reviews that are done of federal and provincial laws, any reviews of policies and practices, any reviews of what's going to so-called be the duty to consult process, because we have a right to be joint governors in our territories, not just in our own nations, but also in the nations that have uh, come here and settled and colonized these territories. UNDRIP actually recognizes that. We have a right to do both. So we can't forget that it's not just internal. We have a right to say how Canada, how the provinces are going to implement that and respect that. And I think that's where the biggest opportunity lies. I'm not worried about what we're going to do in our communities. I'm more worried about what Canadian governments are going to do. And I think my only caution in all of this is to make sure that when we're moving forward, that we include and center and ensure and guarantee the voices the decision making power and authority of indigenous women are also at the forefront so that we don't perpetuate ongoing exclusions and a denial and erasure of voices by current Canadian practices in the implementation of UNDRIP. Indigenous women must be there at the table and UNDRIP recognizes not just that, that you know we have this critical voice as decision makers, but also that we have the right to choose representatives of our own choosing. And I think that's going to radically change the relationship here. I don't think we're gonna see a Canada AFN nation to nation relationship anymore. No offense to AFN. This is gonna be about real nation to nation by the representatives we choose and it's gonna be different. In Mi'kmaq, it might be Mi'kmaq nation to Canada. Somewhere else it might be treaty four First Nations to Canada. And another area it might be a regional area or a tribal council to Canada. The thing is, is that we get to choose and we get to have those conversations and Canada doesn't get to choose that for us. So it's gonna be uncomfortable and it's gonna be messy, but it's long overdue and it's the radical change that I think UNDRIP's gonna usher in. So yeah, those are my comments. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, Pam. That was really rich and so very interesting. Um, I, I was going to ask everyone to, to speak now about, you know, examples of successful implementation. And I feel that, you know, Pam, in some ways you've, you've covered some really interesting ground about implementation within Indigenous communities in particular, right? And this, this power of um, uh, under it being the, the, this floor or foundation. Um, and Brent, you also draw our attention to some really interesting examples out of, of British Columbia and the partnerships that are being formed there in, in, in a rightful way. Um, but I'd like to give Brenda an opportunity. If she'd also like to speak to where she's seen successes and, and, and obviously as, as well, Brenda or Pamela, if you wanted to add to that, we can do so. And then we'll turn to the sort of implementation flashpoints, um, which I think is also gonna engender a really rich uh, exchange. So, so Brenda? Thanks. Um, I feel like sometimes I'm really pessimistic and so I always find this sort of hard. Um, one of the things that I'll note, and I think it's important, is the UN has stopped talking about best practices. And I think that's an important, and I don't think it's just, you know, mincing words, but recognizing that we're constantly learning and evolving and trying to sort of limit our identification of examples to sort of best practices focuses, focuses us away from where are people taking good steps in the right direction. So I do think that good practices is a nice way to think about this. And it's helpful for people like me who can sometimes see the glass is only half empty, which is why Pam is the perfect <laughs> counterbalance because she's eternally optimistic and positive about uh, things. So I think there's really good examples that we can see happening. I think Canada passing Bill C-15 is huge. Mm -hmm. Now I wanna say it was a really great first step. And as Pam has already pointed out, legislation is only as good as the action that follows it, right? And, and the steps to hold people accountable. So I really have high hopes for Canada passing this legislation and for the work that's being done to implement it to have significant impacts. 
there are examples in uh, other regions where we can see implementation happening in different thematic clusters. So I never talk about article one, you know, like individualized, mm -hmm. but sort of what are the areas that are uh, where we're seeing some positive developments. And I think we can see, you know, some of uh, the African countries, there was um, a sort of consultation law that uh, was developed in the Congo that really used the UN declaration as the standard. I think that's really important. I think the work that was happening in uh, Australia on the constitutional questions that led to the Uluru Declaration is really significant. And I think you can, another example along the lines of what Pam was saying about how you take the UN Declaration as a tool and harness it for the opportunities ahead of you, right? So when there was questions in Australia about should Indigenous peoples be recognized in the US, in the, US, in the Australian constitution, there was expert panels set up and Indigenous peoples who were involved in the process took over the process in a very positive way and sort of set out their terms for engagement and the UN declaration and its standard was significant there. I think we have examples where states are starting to set up processes for land, uh, legal, like recognizing what we call Aboriginal title, but sort of recognizing Indigenous people's rights to their lands, territories, and resources. And I think those are significant. I also want to highlight um, in Aotearoa, New Zealand, there is the independent monitoring mechanism that uh, is monitoring the implementation of the UN Declaration that I think is also really significant in that you have the uh, Maori iwis working together to monitor implementation and taking that on for themselves to hold governments accountable and they report every year to the expert mechanism on the rights of Indigenous peoples about the progress that is happening in our federal New Zealand. So another really significant way to start thinking of how to monitor um, this. There's also examples happening at the international level because we also have to remember that the UN itself is also committed to implementing the UN Declaration. And so we can see a lot of the UN agencies starting to really come up with solid policies and positions on free prior and informed consent and the right to participate in decision making. And so we have that example. Um, I think also just maybe to try to bring us back home to Canada, I think some of the co-management legislation that's being developed in the Northwest Territories is really significant. And I think there's great work that's being done there that uh, lines up with the standard setting out in the UN Declaration. And that's the other thing, right? When we're talking implementation, I don't need to see an act that says they're implementing the UN Declaration. What I'm looking for is what activities are states doing in partnership with Indigenous peoples where the outcome is meeting that minimum threshold in the UN Declaration, right? So examples don't always sort of say, you know, <laughs> we're implementing this article or that article. And then there's also, there's really great examples, I think, uh, where people are trying education and language stuff. I think in Latin America, there's some really great examples on some of the efforts to revitalize Indigenous languages that are worth seeing. I've, I've seen some in Guatemala. I know there's some really interesting stuff happening in Mexico. And so, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think there's lots of pieces around the world that we can really draw from here in Canada to continue doing this work. Thank you, Brenda. Um, you bring such a, a depth of knowledge because you're monitoring UNDRIP around the world. Um, and it's just super interesting to sort of, you know, compare that lens to what we're seeing going on in front of us in the, in, in the national sphere. Um, Brenda, do you want to elaborate a little bit on um, successful implementation uh, that you've observed? Uh, sure. I, I think uh, I would speak about um, maybe two or three initiatives in the Canadian context that are, uh, I think, motivated by the spirit of UNDRIP, not necessarily its 
specifically having been passed in, uh, in June by the government of Canada. Um, one of the things that um, we learned in um, both consultations and hearings in relation to um, uh, the UNDRIP legislation uh, in, in which um, uh, some of your speakers uh, uh, presented, um, uh, Ms. Palmiter, for example, and that, that were inspired by this uh, broad international perspective that uh, Professor Gunn brings to the topic, um, are, for example, I would say some of the progressive resource development um, entrepreneurs of Canada, the non-Indigenous uh, progressive entrepreneurs identified dozens and dozens of projects that are under consideration in partnership with uh, Indigenous communities and governments, and with a view that those projects will come to be Indigenous-led, and that as a result, they will be guided by kind of majority ownership of, of Indigenous communities and Indigenous businesses, and be responsive to the goals and aspirations and the, and the care and limitations that Indigenous people and Indigenous communities want to put the boundaries with respect to those developments. That um, philosophy, I think, is really encouraging with respect to the ways in which uh, Indigenous-led and Indigenous-managed and guided prosperity can be achieved. A second example, I think, motivated by the spirit of UNDRIP, at least, was uh, the signing at the Cowessis First Nation in my province of Saskatchewan. Some of you will know that Cowess is one, it was one of the locations where uh, unmarked graves of some hundreds of Indigenous people um, were discovered in the last number of months. Um, so a real heartbreak and challenge, um, heartbreak for Indigenous communities. And I think uh, sometimes the emotional sense of understanding is richer across the country um, as a result of those very, the, the very human tragedy that presented itself there. But in and around the same time as those discoveries, Kaos's First Nation signed an agreement with the government of Canada and the province of Saskatchewan to take much greater responsibility for, and indeed in a self-determination way, responsibility for child welfare and issues related to children within that First Nation. And uh, although it wasn't, I think, uh, specifically tied to uh, UNDRIP, it was within the spirit of what that document will achieve. Uh, so I think there is um, a path forward that offers some, some real promise here and some hope. Um, but I guess I would say that um, it's critical that governments engage on this. Um, you know, what we have here is a, a government, the government of Canada, that passed legislation that essentially uh, embraces UNDRIP uh, and the principles of UNDRIP and the language as part of Canadian law. And that is kind of what has made this fairly meaningful. And now we need to expect governments to deliver on that promise. Indeed, um, that, hearkening back to one of my earlier observations. And let me just quote the two sections of the statute. One of them is section five. The government of Canada must, in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples, take all measures necessary to ensure that the laws of Canada are consistent with the declaration. That should mean that the government of Canada looks at all of its, all of our laws, in partnership with Indigenous peoples to make sure that we're in compliance with the Declaration. That's a very meaningful, legally powerful message. And secondly, and the language in the legislation is a mandate imposed on the government. The second is Section 6, the, the minister uh, must, in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples and with other federal ministries, prepare and implement an action plan to achieve the objectives of the declaration and that action plan has to be developed within two years. It demands of the government of Canada, our government, action and a plan to meet those objectives. So those are, I think, have the potential, you know, action plans often take a little while to develop, two years is a challenge, but there are concrete measures that our national government and I hope ultimately provincial governments will ask of themselves, impose upon themselves to make this real. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, um, Brent. Um, really uh, inspiring examples. Um, so, Pam, I'm, I'm going to ask you if you wanted to highlight another moment of success or and uh, move directly into um, some of these implementation flashpoint issues and, you know, addressing and overcoming them. 
So you can choose how you want to segue into that. Yeah, let's let's go into the next one because that's my that's my fun area. <laughs> And I have to say, we're having lots of questions coming in, and a lot of them have to do with this issue of, um, you know, free pride informed consent. And I think that you may have some views to share on that. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it always amazes me. And I also find it very telling that the scariest thing to people is that Indigenous peoples might be able to say yes or no to something and and that it be valid and that it be respected and that it be authoritative and that it be seen as something we have to respect moving forward uh, it's literally the scariest thing and and here's why because a lot of people governments corporations benefit from the current status quo right that there's a reason why the status quo seems almost immovable it will fight to protect itself you move a marker one way and it always reorients itself somewhere back to protect itself and there's like a million of examples of that so to me none of this is going to mean anything unless we get to a space where we can respect the right of indigenous nations to say yes yes with conditions no maybe later it's and it's as simple as that and that's no different than in a medical context where you know a doctor goes all over the, the risks and and potential benefits of something and you have the right to say yes no maybe later i need to think about it uh and i need more than a week to think about it and i need more than this three months that's in your planning measure to think about it and it's and, and that's where you think about that like the free that there's no consequence i'm not going to be jailed if i say no i don't think i want this project to go through because that's not free that's not a free decision that's not free from duress if a company and a government comes in and says do this or a your people are going to end up in jail and b you get nothing that's not really free and then prior don't come when the the project is already a done deal and you've got stakes in the ground that's not prior prior is that conception stage you know what we're thinking we want to do this project five years from now let's start talking about whether it's doable in your territory let's start talking about if it is doable what are the kinds of things we should consider uh, and if it is doable, who benefits, who decides, who's a part of this, who isn't, how do we ensure protections? You know, so you've got the free from duress, all the political duress, legal duress, law enforcement duress, all of that stuff. The, it has to be prior before, at conception stage. Um, and it has to be informed. And informed means having the resources to be informed a company simply can't walk into a community meeting and say here's our study that we did we paid for with our pipeline peeps and we think it's all okay uh and it's like well wait a second we have our own elders that maybe they want to do land use studies and we have our advocates over here who talk who want to do their own study on safety of women around any potential construction camps and we have our own scientists and we'll have partnerships with scientists who want to do uh, look at this study and take the time to have to do it um, and have the resources to be able to do it. Because what's happened with the evolution of the Supreme Court of Canada's duty to consult is now in order to be able to tick the box and be able to forge ahead with all of these projects, First Nations get inundated sometimes they have a hundred emails in a day so that any municipality any government can just say oh yeah we're doing this we're doing this we're doing this by the way and we notified you where's the capacity where's the resources where's the ability the time the goodwill to be able to consider all of these fully and in the majority of cases well in all of the cases where i'm working there is none, there's none of that. Nobody wants to put up the time, the effort or the resources to do that. So this is gonna be a sticking point because the, the current status quo is unjust. It causes death, it causes environmental destruction and it causes dispossession of indigenous peoples. There are some positive examples, but those aren't the rule. So it's gonna hurt 
to change all of that. And there's going to be a lot of people who don't want that to change. They don't mind adding a little bit of Indigenous flavor on the side. They don't mind as, oh, yeah, we'll do some cultural awareness training. Oh, yes, we'll pay your elders to open meetings. Oh, yes, we'll guarantee you priority hiring and contracts, which almost never works out when you talk to the unions. Uh, but when it comes to actually respecting just the basics, the right to say yes, yes with conditions, no, or maybe later, give me some time. If that's not at the root of all of this, then it's not going to be what we are hoping that it's going to be. And I think about that in terms of how women, Indigenous women, have been exploited, abused, traded, disappeared, and murdered because their fundamental human right to say yes, no, maybe later has never been respected. And so if you take that and, and place that on all Indigenous peoples, of course we're going to continue to be exploited, abused, disappeared, murdered, dispossessed, and oppressed. And I think that's got to change. We have the right to say yes or no in medical. We have the right to say yes or no on class field trips. We have the right to say yes or no on a contract. We have a right to say yes or no in many contexts, except for Indigenous peoples. We have impoverished decision-making ability. And I would like to think that UNDRIP supports the fulsome ability to make decisions, even if it's not in line with what a transnational corporation wants to do. Okay, thank you so much, Pam. Uh, um, uh, Brent, would you would you care to speak about what you see as some some flashpoint issues, and then we'll we'll turn to to Brenda if that's okay. I don't think there's uh, any doubt that the issue related to free prior and informed consent is a um, significant uh, flashpoint, if if that's the right phrase. Um, uh, Pam has spoken about some of the significant challenges there, uh, and l let me add a couple of um, observations and qualifications to that partly on the basis of evidence that the Senate heard on this question and partly on the basis of a fair amount of academic thought and writing. Uh, some um, people who have the most significant reservations about the adoption of UNDRIP into Canadian law uh, have suggested that free prior and informed consent is a somewhat enriched uh, uh, formula with respect to duty to consult. Uh, others at the other end of the spectrum have said, and I would take uh, aspects of what Pam's uh, submission and observations were to be um, the, the hard language is veto. If, if, if this is not acceptable to our communities, it can't proceed. Uh, it's clear in my view that um, the first uh, community of interest, either intentionally or not, is uh, misconstruing the meaning of free prior and informed consent. And I would say it like this in simple terms. Words like um, free, prior, informed, uh, consult, cooperate are process words. But as Pam has pointed out, the word consent is not a process word, it's an autonomy word. And she uses the parallel, a, a powerful parallel about um, the consent to medical treatment and the autonomy that people have to say no. I think that's a fair kind of a, a parallel. So it's unreasonable for those who say this is just an enrichment of the duty to consult and, and think that that's the final answer. And some have even suggested that we have got such stability with respect to um, uh, the duty to consult with respect to Indigenous communities on resource development projects that we don't want to upset the apple cart. That has two additional problems for it. For it. I think one is it, it uh, entrenches a certain status quo that is uh, um, not necessarily completely unsatisfactory, but certainly not fully satisfactory to Indigenous communities and governments. And the second is that these questions are constantly evolving uh, in the litigation and the jurisprudence that we've seen over the last 20 or 25 years, and that will continue. Indeed, it should. At the other end of the spectrum, the question of whether or not there is an absolute no uh, presents two problems with it. One is the degree to which it compromises the sovereignty of Canada in its inability to uh, regulate and govern in, on behalf of all Canadians. And the document itself, the, the uh, UN declaration itself, acknowledges that nothing in the declaration uh, it should be taken to impair or compromise the political unity or sovereignty of existing sovereign nations. 
So I think the argument has to be we need to address this question within the boundaries of a sovereign Canada. And that, I think, raises a, a way of thinking about this that is uh, slightly different than the one that Pam presented. Uh, some of the arguers, uh, Dr. Uh, Terpel Lafon, for example, um, has suggested that the question about what constitutes free prior informed consent is contextual. And if I can take a minute, let me offer you a small example of the way in which I think it's fair to think about this contextually. Imagine that a government has an interest in building um, a power line to a, say a northern or remote community where they don't have electricity and they would get electricity through this power line. If you were to run that power line right through your parents or your own home, you would say this is unacceptable. And that would be the case with respect to an indigenous community. If that power line ran right through a reserve and right through your home or right across a cemetery where your parents or your children were buried, that's a powerful argument to say, I should be able to say, no, this is unacceptable. If the power line is running perhaps in other areas, like say a traditional territory where indigenous people have hunted and fished and maybe continue to, that's an important right and value, but it's not quite as powerful a right as the power line running right through your house. And that will, I think, invite a contextual thinking by an indigenous community and a government, and also whether or not that power line is more justified when it takes into account the kind of uh, impact it might have on a community. Another way of thinking about this in contextual terms is what's the importance of the project? If the project is a power line to a northern community, there's a certain kind of inherent legitimacy to it. If the initiative is to build a golf course, there's nothing wrong with golf, but the justification for, for compromising or moderating somebody else's interests is infinitely less when it comes to a golf course than it does to a power line or some, some urgent needed public service. And I think that produces a, a bit of a way of thinking about the nuance that will be required where in some circumstances, free prior and informed consent will mean no means no. In other cases, it will be the resistance to yes needs to be moderated in some constructive way. Thanks. Uh, Brenda. Thank you, Brent. Um, and Brenda, would you, would you like to speak? Yeah, thank you. Um, I will say this is my least favorite topic. It really frustrates and angers me that we keep getting stuck here. And I just want to say not good words and say, just get over it, like move on and stop stop putting this out there. And I don't know what it is that gets people so worked up. And I think uh, you know, Pam noting that this is, it's telling that the fact that, you know, Indigenous peoples can say no, may, like, does that mean that people don't see us as people, right? Like, is, is this really where we are? And Pam's nodding and it's gonna get me really upset, but it's like, it, I thought we started with the point that Indigenous peoples are peoples, right? And so why don't we get to say yes and no like everyone else? And it's really frustrating to me that people invoke this veto language because I think, again, it's racist trying to like get people to think about Russia and China in the Security Council acting irrationally and terrorizing the world. And it's really, really problematic because I also have never had anyone explain to me what a veto means. Consent absolutely means the right to say yes or no. Like it's not consent if you don't have a right to say no. So like get over that conversation. Like stop trying to tell me and finesse this and try, stop trying to equate me with like world leaders blocking progress or something like that is really problematic. Every time you make that association, think about what you're trying to say. Now to calm down and come back to this, I want us to remember why is this right in there? Why is there a human right of Indigenous peoples to participate in decision making and to engage in that process with free, free prior and informed consent? And this is a fundamental aspect to protecting Indigenous peoples' human rights. Because how do we know if a decision is going to impact Indigenous peoples? How do we understand how to protect the rights and how to make sure Indigenous peoples languages, questions, and peoplehood is continued. We can't trust the government. We, they haven't done a very good job. And Pam has pointed out all of the genocidal activities they've engaged in. 
So the UN Declaration and the human rights structure fundamentally says it's for Indigenous peoples to protect their rights that we want to make sure they're at the table. And it's part of writing that colonial relationship where Canada was doing it all for Indigenous peoples and did a very bad job. I also want to say that all of these conversations where we think we need to try to figure it out, remember that these are international human rights standards that have been developed over decades. There is a ton of studies and information already out there on what free prior and informed consent is and what the right to participate in decision making. And so I think it is really important that we don't lose sight of the standards that have been introduced internationally. And importantly, when we're talking about this in a Canadian context, we need to not conflate domestic understanding of Aboriginal and treaty rights and how governments have been allowed to justifiably infringe those rights with the international human rights standards. The standards for um, infringe, like there is actually, if you ever try to do research on like, what do I need to do to infringe an international human right? you can't find it like that, that doesn't exist right like because under international human rights law these rights are are profound they're fundamental and there's very few circumstances where governments are going to be uh, permitted to limit human rights and this right to participate in decision making and free prior and informed consent is a human right and governments aren't just going to be able to say that laundry list of justifications that were raised in, can, uh, in Canadian case law, that doesn't apply anymore. That's not the balance. We have to think of it as human rights as one of the highest values we say we put on in the world. So anything that's going to limit a human right has to be more important than that human right. That fulfilling human rights is the number one goal. And so that's where we start from. And I just want to remind people as well that under international human rights law, that yes, Canada has a right to its territorial integrity and political unity, but that is contingent upon Canada fulfilling its obligations to respect self-determination. And this goes back to the UN Charter. And so Canada, if you want to maintain your political unity and territorial integrity, you must uphold people's right to self-determination, including Indigenous peoples. And if that right to self-determination is not upheld, those people are entitled to a remedy. And international law does not prescribe what that remedy is, but the remedy must be about realizing that self-determination. I also don't hear any Indigenous people talking about implementing the UN Declaration in a way that's going to uh, break down Canadian uh, nation state. What they are talking about is a fundamental shift in our decision-making processes and the power structures that exist. But that's not breaking down our political unity or territorial integrity. That's challenging how we distribute power in society. And those are very different things. I, and then there may be, and maybe there are people who a nation out there that does actually want to separate from Canada, I have not heard that in any of the work that I've come across, but I'm, I'm not limiting it. I'm just saying I haven't heard that. So I don't think that's the issue. The question is, and what the participation in decision making is, is recognizing that Indigenous peoples are best positioned to protect their rights and that they must be at the table where their rights are at stake, right? AKA governments squeeze over a bit, there has to be room for Indigenous governments. Thank you so much, Brenda. Once again, I'm so grateful to have you here with your, um, your expert knowledge on drawing upon international law and international legal forums and principles to help us understand you know, what it is that UNDRIP is all about as this, this international treaty. Um, we're getting close to the end of our, our time together. Um, and there's really great questions about things like, how does the Indian Act fit into this, right? How can we, how can we implement UNDRIP and we still got the Indian Act? Um, 
But I'm going to ask uh, each of you if you'd just like to share a, a closing comment with you. I know that um, Senator Cotter is on a very tight um, deadline because he's in the middle of a sitting and popped out to join us. And so I'm going to invite him to, to speak first. And you can take on the Indian Act or whatever it is that you'd like to, to leave us with. Um, and then uh, close with Pam and Brenda. Thanks. Um, I won't, uh, thank you. I won't take on the Indian Act. Um, let me uh, just uh, observe in a, the more general way that uh, the opportunity, despite uh, uh, points of disagreement or uh, you know, lack of clarity regarding the future, the opportunity that this legislation and the commitment by the government of Canada to deliver on it, uh, which will require the government of Canada, our government, to be held accountable is an unbelievable opportunity and path forward. And I'm, if I may just borrow a quote uh, from uh, somebody I greatly admire, a historic chief pound maker from Saskatchewan, recently uh, pardoned um, and rightly so. Uh, he said, uh, and I think this is relevant to our situation today and tomorrow, he said one time long ago um, when First Nations people were facing the challenge of the prairies being uh, settled in basically colonial ways, he said, I grow sad when I think of the man sitting beside the trail, and as the trail grew over, he could not find his way again. We cannot go back, nor can we sit beside the trail. We must go forward in the hope of finding a better future. And I think UNDRIP offers that opportunity, particularly as a message to governments and to Canadians that we have to find that way. It'll be a path that won't be crafted for Indigenous people, but crafted by Indigenous people. Uh, avoiding ill-considered policies that we've already discussed in, and, uh, and rightly critiqued. Uh, um, but I also think that it will be multiple paths uh, to achieve both the human rights potential and the economic and social prosperity that Indigenous people haven't been able to do uh, anywhere near uh, their right and entitlement uh, over essentially you know, one and a half centuries or more in this country. So a big opportunity, a big challenge. I think one of the keys will be to hold governments accountable, and particularly the federal government accountable, uh, for the, the richness of the commitment it made, but it won't be uh, as meaningful if that richness, richness of commitment isn't turned into real action. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Brent. Uh, Brenda, Pam, which of you would like to, to give us a quick closing comment first? Can I go next and you can wrap us up? Huh? I feel like Pam and I need to learn how to do rock, paper, scissors online. And, uh, <laughs> work these out, yeah. Um, sorry, we're not shaking our fists at people. Now I realize my rock, paper, scissors might have looked a little different than I intended in my head. Um, well, I just wanted to thank everyone for coming today and having the opportunity to sit here today and think about, you know, what does implementing the UN Declaration mean and, and does it need to be scary? And, you know, I think where I land is that implementing the UN Declaration is going to shake things up in Canada. Like, but if we really want to reconcile, we have to engage in that transformation process. Like, we can't say that we want to reconcile but we don't want anything to change right otherwise reconciliation is assimilation right it's just we want to bring indigenous peoples into the fold and so i think we have to really come to terms with that implementing the un declaration and reconciliation is going to require some big changes but it doesn't have to be scary it can actually really support the goals and aspirations that Canada already holds out, right? We are in a climate crisis, and I think that Indigenous peoples have a lot to contribute to addressing this major challenge in Canadian and global societies, right? So, like, yes, it's going to shift things that when a company wants to engage in resource development, they're not just going to be able to, you know, get the provincial license anymore, or the provincial licensing scheme is going to have to be complicated. And it's already complicated. And I'm sorry that it's going to make it more complicated. But what it might actually do is lead to greater certainty. And I think this is where people aren't in a great place is 
recognizing the uncertainty that we're actually in right now, the amount of challenges that are happening on major projects and how long major projects are getting stalled because we don't have good processes. So we can actually get more certainty and make better decisions, better for everyone and start actually living those values that Canadians say they uphold. And we have a strong foundation in, in Canada already. We can build up from Section 35 if we take away some of the limitations that were brought in from the Supreme Court. We do have the foundation of the duty to consult and accommodate that recognizes consent already. So there's a foundation. It's, you know, we're not just, we can't just sort of put the um, free prior and informed consent and participation into consultation, but we can build up from the basis where the Canadian courts have already said in certain circumstances, consent is required. And what I see happening in the UN declaration is expanding those circumstances and really lopping off that low end of consultation. I'm not sure that low end has um, much use in the international human rights world, unless it's you know a project that has a very minimal and is very removed from a people. But we have those foundations already in Canada. And so I think what I'm looking for is for people to step up, take the brave steps necessary to really start living the values we espouse. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda, so much, um, Pamela. Okay, I'll just make it really quick. I think, you know, that despite all of the political circumstances, which are going to be a challenge and all of the laws that we have to deal with, that UNDRIP is an opportunity to be the foundation of the radical change that we need. And when I say radical change, I know that upsets people, but it's about radical change for good, human rights, environmental protection, that kind of thing. And, you know, I invite people to think about Indigenous rights uh, and human rights protections that are recognized in UNDRIP in their own context. Imagine if we said to a woman who has the right to say no to sexual relations, we'll consult with you if you want to have sex. Maybe we'll accommodate some ways in which you want to have sex, but you don't have the right to say no. We would never in a million years do that. We wouldn't do that in a medical context. We wouldn't do that in a parental context. And people would be horrified if that was the standard, that you, you never have the right to say no. I mean, think of the generations of women who fought against that. So just as we celebrate those rights, we also have to celebrate that, you know, Indigenous human rights have lagged behind. We haven't been treated as people and we don't want to continue that. So we would never say in a medical context, you know, uh, your right to say no to this surgery, that's a veto. That's terrible. Or women, like you, you have a veto. Like it's not described that way. Consent is consent, the right to say yes or no, maybe later conditions. And I think if, if people just embraced that, they would understand just how impactful that is on an individual human being level and how much and how, how important that is to protect for all of us, because it's a slippery slope. You don't recognize that for Indigenous peoples, it can happen to you someday if that becomes the standard. And we never want that to be the standard. We're trying to bring Indigenous peoples up to the people standard, where we get to have the same standard as people, human beings. And, and I think if we think of it that way, and we go forward and understand that being people together is enforcing all of each other's human rights, then at the end of the day, while something might be interesting to do, it might be fun to do, it might be powerful to do, it might be wealthy to do, eh, if it doesn't meet with the basic human rights standards, it's probably not the right thing to do. And there's always alternatives. You know, we're people, we're human beings. So th that's what I would say. And uh, you know, hopefully we get to keep having these conversations because they're very spirited and interesting. And I think people need to hear them instead of just like the brief one or two minute commentary you get to have in the media and not really fully engage. I think you can see just how important this is to everybody and we'll all be better for it, so. Okay, thank you, Pamela. That was a fantastic uh, way to, to bring us to a close. I wanna thank uh, all three of you again uh, for being here virtually today. Um, for your insights, your comments, your knowledge, your vast knowledge 
about implementation. Um, for everybody watching, thank you for joining us. There's going to be a video um, posted on the McEachin Institute's YouTube channel and website. Um, next week's panel, the, the last in the series, it's on implementing the calls to justice um, of the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry. And uh, it features two amazing Mi'kmaq leaders who have spent decades um, advancing work in regional, national, and international human rights forums, and that's, that's Sherry Picto and, and Cheryl Simon. And they're going to be joined by Alex Neve, who, who served as the Secretary General for Amnesty International for 20 years and worked closely in partnership with communities and governments to help bring that inquiry into being. So that's going to be next Thursday um, at 12 noon Atlantic. And you just visit the McEachin Institute webpage to register. And so I say, Walalan, thank you. Um, and everyone, take care. And I'll see you next week, I hope. Bye.